Well, welcome to Forest Hills Church Online. My name is Pastor Andrew. Thank you for joining us in this way. We're so glad that you, uh, that you are here. We're a church who loves God with all of our heart. We seek to grow in our faith in Christ. And we hope to serve through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So welcome to that journey. Uh, we are in, currently in Lent as today is Palm Sunday. In Palm Sunday, we sort of are beginning our celebration of Holy Week as we follow Jesus to the cross. Um, we've been talking about how deep the Father's love for us. We've been using that song as kind of a, a way to help us understand the gospel. And um, one of the things that we need to talk about before we can talk about the joy of Christ's resurrection is His death. And so last week we talked about how deep the wounds, how deep the wounds of Jesus. Today we're going to talk about how deep the grave. Um, and as we do, I actually want to uh, take a verse from the very beginning of the Bible, from the end of the book of Genesis. Genesis 50, verse 20. And we'll see how this verse plays in to uh, our topic on the grave. But Joseph is speaking here to his brothers. And Joseph says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. We'll see um, how that plays into our, our account of Jesus in the grave. We've, we've discussed Friday, the Friday when Jesus is crucified, and today we're going to talk about Saturday. What, what was happening on Saturday, the day when Jesus was in the grave? Um, and so, as we get to that, we're going to prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we sing to our Lord now. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished It is finished It is finished I will not boast in it no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. I'm 
But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Today begins our Holy Week celebration as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, the capital of God's people and the place where the coming events are about to unfold. Luke 19, 29 through 40. As Jesus came to Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he gave two disciples a task. He said, go into the village over there. When you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying it? Just say, its master needs it. Those who have been sent found it exactly as he said. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, its master needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their clothes on the colt, and lifted Jesus onto it. As Jesus rode along, they spread their clothes on the road. As Jesus approached the road leading down from the Mount of Olives, the whole throng of his disciples began rejoicing. They praised God with a loud voice because of all the mighty things they had seen. They said, Blessing on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, scold your disciples. Tell them to stop. He answered, I tell you, if they are silent, the stones would shout. In our prayer time today, there will be bolded words that you will pray along with me. Please join me now. Almighty God, we are continually amazed at how you turn the world upside down. For a savior of the world, we would have chosen a powerful prince. But you chose a baby born in a manger. We rejoice in your entry into the world and into our lives. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Joining with the crowd, we sing your praises and exalt your reign. Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. For disciples to help Jesus through his ministry, we would have chosen well connected with power and righteous lives. But you chose fishermen, a tax collector, and other such outcasts. For those whom we would want to have included in the kingdom of God, We would have chosen those who look and sound like we do, but you chose the world. Forgive us those times when we think too highly of ourselves and remind us always that you ask from us lives dedicated to service to you and to our neighbors. For a grand entrance into Jerusalem, we would have chosen a white stallion, but you chose a donkey. Jesus rode in Jerusalem not as a conquering king, but in humility, the servant king, ready to complete the task for which he had walked this world. When riding high on the poles on Palm Sunday, we would have chosen to stay there as long as we could. But you chose to clear the temple. We try to honor and celebrate you, but we know there are areas in our lives where we reject or ignore you. Today, give us the strength to sing your praises at times we might otherwise dishonor you. For a place of coronation, we would have chosen a palace with a wonderful decorated royal throne room. But you chose a cross. Stir up within us the gift of faith that we may not only praise him with our lips, but may follow him in the way of the cross. When you chose people to show the love and grace extend to us in Jesus Christ, we would have chosen somebody else. But you chose each of us. Use us today. We shall triumph over those who surround us and stand in confidence in the Lord our God. Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. Lord is our strength and our might. The Lord has become our salvation. Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Today is Palm Sunday, 
It's the uh, part of the story in which Jesus enters into Jerusalem with great fanfare and elevated excitement, and people are hailing him as the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's quite the title, but it's well-deserved. Jesus has, has earned this status. He spent three years healing people and casting out demons and raising people from the dead and performing many other miracles. He's, he's blessed people. He's forgiven people. And he's also spoken unheard of things about the kingdom of God. This Jesus was one of a kind. All hail the king would be the proper response. All hail the king. But there are some other things, though, about this Jesus. Certain things that he said only in secrets. He shared only with his disciples. He said that he would have to suffer and that he would have to die. Now, what could he have meant by that? To suffer and die at the hands of your enemies would be an, un, an extremely unkingly thing to do. And his disciples may have thought, well, sure, King Jesus is a bit out of the norm. I mean, he's a little bit off sometimes. Why, why did he choose a donkey to ride into town on? I would have chosen a, a regal-looking horse, maybe a, a decked-out camel. But here he is now, and his followers are with him, and momentum seems to be growing. The, the, the crowds seem to be on his side. So it looks like we're on to something great here. I'll hail the king. But all that excitement died away pretty quickly. In a mere five days, Jesus would be handed over into the power of his enemies, and he would succumb to what he calls the hour when darkness reigns. And last week, we looked at Jesus' harrowing experience on the cross. We considered his deep wounds, his eternal wounds, the very same wounds by which we are healed. All hail the King. We have walked with Jesus to the cross, and as a result, we've endured some tough Sundays, some tougher sermons. You know, we began this series on a high note, talking about the, our Heavenly Father's love for us. But as the gospel goes, we had to stop and do the hard work of, of shedding light on our own sin and on the shame that goes with it, which of course leads to separation from God and ultimately death. We had to consider this bad news. But in response to our sin and shame, God sent His only begotten Son to be born as one of us, to live a perfect life, to suffer and to die in our place. And so we have to dive into the reality of Christ's death. It's the reality of the Father's searing loss. It's the reality of the wounds which mar the chosen one. And so we would not categorize these topics as fun, or light, it's, it's certainly not easy. And yet it is essential. Because if we are going to call Jesus our Savior, we need to know what we are being saved from. And if we are going to bow before Jesus as our Lord, we need to know what kind of king he is. And if we are going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on Easter morning, then we need to know about his death. So that is what we turn to today as we discuss how deep the grave. Now death, of course, is something we all try to avoid each and every day. We try to eat right and we pay attention to safety precautions and we check labels for hazardous material warnings. You know, we, we drive carefully. We try to take care so that in a given situation nothing bad happens. We can wake up tomorrow to avoid death again, right? We don't want to die. And that's good. That's as it should be. Life, we would say, is, is the ultimate gift of God. Of course, life has its share of hardships and struggles. But overall, each day we conclude, this life is worth living. The people in my life are worth loving. 
And even if I have nothing and no one, I can still use this life to praise my God and to faithfully serve Him. And so life in and of itself is a good thing. And therefore, death is the enemy. The Bible mentions 1 Corinthians 15, 26. It says very clearly, death is our final foe, right? Death is against us. In fact, biblically speaking, we can say that death is unnatural. No, it's true that we all eventually die. But this outcome is not what God had originally intended. Yet here we are, overcome by sin and separated from the God who gives life. This is an unnatural state of affairs. We're not meant to be separated from God. Now I know our, our sermon timeline is not strictly following the events of Holy Week. Um, today we're talking about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, while last week we already talked about Jesus on the cross. We talked about how He took on our sin. He bore the weight of our sin. He took upon Himself the righteous wrath of God. We said that our life is found in His blood. We said by His wounds we are healed. Right? That's Good Friday. But what about Saturday? We say Jesus died on Friday. He resurrected on Sunday. What happened on Saturday? Well, we turn to Matthew's Gospel uh, to read his account. This is from Matthew 27, verse 57. It says, That evening a man named Joseph came. He was a rich man from Arimathea who had become a disciple of Jesus. He came to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. This would be Friday night. Pilate gave him permission to take it. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean uh, uh, linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had carved out of the rock. After he rolled a large stone at the door of the tomb, he went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting in front of the tomb. The next day, which was the day after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. They said, Sir, we remember that while that deceiver was still alive, he said, After three days I will arise. Therefore, order the grave to be sealed until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people he's been raised from the dead, and his last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate replied, You have soldiers for guard duty. Go and make it as secure as you know how. And they went and secured the tomb by sealing the stone and posting the guard. The first thing we must take away from this account is maybe even so basic we don't need to mention it, but we need to take away the actual historical, physical death of Jesus Christ. That's paramount. Okay? The ancient Romans may not have had the, the metal, medical technology that we do today, but they understood when a body was dead. The excruciating process of crucifixion, coupled with the intense beating that Jesus had already received, make the definitive case that we are talking about a dead man. And I belabor this point because it is on this very fact that rests the entirety of our faith. Right? Paul, Paul tells us, again, 1 Corinthians 15, he says that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain. And he says it's a complete waste of time. Everyone ought to feel sorry for us. Sorry for us poor suckers who believed such an outrageous lie. So if Christ did not actually die, then he did not actually rise. And there is out there, you might have heard, a school of thought called the swoon theory, which simply states that Jesus did not actually die, but he was merely unconscious. He had fainted, uh, he had swooned, and then he eventually revived. Okay, but this is not what we read in Scripture. The Bible tells the story of a dead 
Jesus of Nazareth being buried in the fresh tomb of a wealthy Pharisee named Joseph of Arimathea. And I mentioned earlier that death is, not, is, is unnatural, that, that we are not supposed to end this way. And this is why we can rightly refer to death as a foe, but we can also refer to death as the end. Right? It is the end of life. It's also the end of community and of our relationships. It's the end of our personhood and identity. It is the end of faith. In the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, chapter 38, King Hezekiah, he falls ill and he's about to die. But he pleads with God. He turns to God and asks for relief, for healing. And in answer to that prayer, God grants him 15 more years to live. And Hezekiah worships the Lord with a song of thanksgiving. And in that song, he ends with these words. He says, The underworld can't thank you, nor can death praise you. Those who go down to the pit can't hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living can thank you, as I do today. Hezekiah tells us here, death is the end. We cannot even praise God. We cannot hope in God. Death renders our existence and our history as meaningless. And that's why it is such an enemy. And we humans are are pretty good at sugarcoating death. We might refer to it as just a doorway, or we say all the time, we say people have passed away. But in our hope-filled phrasing, we should not forget that death is the foe who brings the end. What did Jesus experience on that Holy Saturday? And I would say nothing. Nothing. He experienced nothing because he was dead. We, we have got to understand the eternal, infinite, unending God ended. The God of life, through whom all creation came into being, an initiator and animator of all of life, did nothing and could do nothing. Jesus, the healer, the hope bringer, the life giver, he did nothing and could do nothing. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice the Savior of the world, the way to eternal life. He did nothing and could do nothing because he was dead. That Holy Saturday was a day like any any other. A day, another day in which the the, 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 the grave had claimed another person. The unnatural consequence of sin had claimed the sinless God. The unnatural consequence of sin had claimed the sinless God. Most any death is tragic. Again, we know we shouldn't end this way. We know there's something about it that's, that's not right. It's tragic when someone dies. We've all endured the experience of of saying goodbye to loved ones or to friends. We we know about the process of grief and loss. It causes a deep pain. And again, in our heart of hearts, we know it's not right. It's not natural. Life is not meant to end this way. Imagine the grief and sorrow of those who followed Jesus. They believed, they had hope that this man was truly the Messiah, that he would really set things right, that he would really restore God's people. But now, he was gone. He was buried behind a stone in a grave, just like everyone else. Not only do the disciples mourn for their best friend and their leader, their, their teacher and their mentor, but they also mourn for their dashed hopes, right? They they feel foolish in their sorrow. They feel like their faith was in vain. God's chosen one, this Messiah, 
had come to nothing. And so will the kingdom he had proclaimed. And truly, this was a Saturday of mourning. Well, for the chief priests and the Pharisees and the leaders of the Jewish people, this Holy Saturday, a Sabbath no less, this was a pretty busy Sabbath for them. They were up to quite a lot of business on this supposed day of rest. They uh, set up a meeting with Pilate and they asked for permission to seal the tomb out of their paranoia, their, their thought that the disciples were scheming to play a trick. The pilot granted them the use of some soldiers, and so they then go to the, the site of the tomb, and they make sure that it's sealed up and fully secured. And after running all these errands, you can almost imagine them wiping the sweat from their brows and letting out a long sigh of relief. Whew, thank God that is over. Now, on to our Sabbath rest. We should not miss as well the descriptor these Jewish leaders use when they refer to Jesus. They call him that deceiver. Jesus was that deceiver. I tell you, my even saying that is, is just... It makes me wary. My heart breaks for anyone who's going to peg Jesus as a deceiver. Jesus, who is the embodiment of God's truth, the deceiver. And the, the Greek word there is planos. And it means deceiver, but it also carries with it a further connotation. It means one who tries to get others to veer off the path. Now, who comes to mind when we give that definition? One who tries to get others to veer off of God's path. Who fits that definition, of course, is Satan, the father of lies. He is the deceiver. He deceives so that we will veer off course. And these priests and Pharisees are literally doing the devil's work. They're blaspheming Jesus as they cast him in Satan's role. And all the while, they're thinking that they're shielding the people from some great harm. Jesus was right when he earlier called these men children of the devil. And this brings up my last point. While it was God's plan for Jesus to die in this way, these events were also a satanic victory. Okay? We ought not to take death lightly. Yes, we believe and affirm that through Christ, our victory over death has been secure, but we must remember that that victory came at the highest cost. It cost the very life of God. And as Jesus lay in that deep grave, we see the words of Scripture come alive. Words that come from the book of Genesis. Way back in Genesis, we have the story of a Hebrew whose who, his name is Joseph. And somehow this Hebrew, through uh, this roller coaster of events, Joseph becomes second in command over Egypt. If you remember the story, he's sold by his brothers into slavery, and he becomes a servant in a rich man's house. But eventually, he is accused of indecency, and he is thrown into prison. But God gave Joseph the ability to interpret dreams, and he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, and Pharaoh promoted him to second in command. And so here is Joseph, second in command over all Egypt, and he's speaking to his estranged brothers these brothers who come looking for food from Egypt, these brothers who years ago sold him off into slavery. And Joseph almost speaks on behalf of Jesus when he says to these brothers, you meant evil against me back when you sold me into slavery. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. What you meant for evil, 
God meant for good, right? What the Romans meant for evil, what the chief priests meant for evil, what Satan himself meant for evil, and what I, in my sin, mean for evil, God meant for good. God meant for our good, our eternal good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive, eternally alive, redeemed and restored because our God was willing to lie down in the cold darkness of the deep grave. And this is a truth that ought to cause us to tremble and to realize how blessed we are to know a God who can repurpose evil into good a God who can turn death into life. Amen. Now, I, I realize we've, again, we've, we've jumped the gun on the storyline here. Today, the people celebrate Jesus as he enters triumphantly into Jerusalem. And this coming Friday, we'll take time to commemorate Good Friday, the day when Jesus was crucified. And I hope we all know what Sunday entails. But again, before the mountaintop, we must pass through the valley of the shadow of death. We cannot have Easter morning without the deep grave. All hail the King. Amen. Well, as we come to close our service today, uh, I want to remind you uh, that, that we are called to give generously of our time and our efforts and also of our monies. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be a part of the body of Christ and to be used by God for His glory and for the building up of His kingdom. So I just want to encourage you to give generously, uh, if you can, to the work of this church. Um, certainly, we don't want you to give begrudgingly, um, but it is an, a, an opportunity for us to uh, show our praise and worship and our thankfulness to God when we give our monies to His kingdom. Uh, and so I just want to encourage you to do so. And with that, we also want to remind you of our Good Friday service. Seven o'clock this Friday, we're going to gather at church and celebrate and commemorate the work that Christ has done for us. It'll be a little bit of a different service, more of a, a somber feel, but it will be a powerful uh, uh, reminder. And hopefully we just, we're praying the Holy Spirit will just move among us and bring us to a new understanding of what it means for Christ to die on the cross for our sins. So please join us for Good Friday. And of course, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, a wonderful opportunity to invite friends and family to, to give them a taste of what church is like. So we want to encourage you to, to come and bring as many people as you can uh, to celebrate that glorious Easter Sunday. And with that, I want to turn to our, our memory verse which comes from Genesis 50, verse 20. And again, we imagine these words of Joseph spoken in the mouth of Jesus as he says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. I'm going to leave you with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and may your heart shout aloud, all hail the King. Amen.